Hi, and welcome to part 5 of the MCO CNC lathe retrofit series. In this video, I will cover the procedure I used for replacing the spindle bearings, some much needed wiring cleanup, replacement of the safety switch for the door, and lastly, how the spindle encoder was added to the lathe. After I mounted the motor back into the lathe and had wired up the VFD, the spindle was running nicely. However, it made some scary noises from time to time, indicating that the bearings were shot. Since I did not want to use the lathe in this state, I bought a couple of replacement bearings. This Emco lathe uses 6006-2Z deep groove ball bearings. Typically a lathe would use angular contact bearings or tapered roller bearings. Those types are more suitable to handle actual loads. But I could not find any that would have the same outer dimensions as the original 6006 bearings. To keep things simple, I just replaced the original bearings with new ones of the same type. I will not be using the lathe for making heavy cuts, so I hope these deep groove ball bearings will have a long lifespan anyway. The 2C suffix indicates that there is a shield on both sides. This should keep grease in and dust out. The bearings are very cheap at around 7 euros each. First the spindle has to be removed. Be prepared for some unconventional techniques, as this is the first time that I'm replacing spindle bearings and I may not have the right tools. Before I started this, I had to remove the spindle cover. There is one screw that is particularly hard to reach as it is inside the cabinet between the bottom plate and the underside of the spindle. Like most parts on the lathe, the headstock is tiny. Next, I am removing the pulley and the old encoder ring with the pulley puller. I use the fender washer at the tip of the tool, because otherwise it would just disappear into the spindle bore. It can be a bit difficult to align everything when everything is still loose. There is only little force required here, so I might have been able to pull it off manually, but this is much more controlled, and I need the pulley in one piece, so I can reuse it. To remove the spindle I sprayed some WD-40 around the bearings. I will not be reusing these old bearings, so I am not worried about WD-40 getting into them. A piece of PVC pipe was used as a spacer. A threaded rod was placed into the spindle and had a nut and fender washer at the back side, so I could pull the spindle out by tightening another nut from the front. Also, to push the bearing off the shaft, I was getting a bit creative with the spacers. In addition to that, I used a brass piece of round stock as a hammer, since this would not damage the shaft. Hitting the outer race of the bearing is not a good idea, but this bearing was already damaged before I took it out of the lathe, so I was not too worried about that. I used a similar contraption to pull the rear spindle bearing from the headstock. These are all of the parts in the correct order. The bearing on the back side, a spring washer to provide preload to the bearings, a spacer, the spindle itself, another spacer and the bearing from the front side. With this arrangement, both of the bearings will receive a preload force from a single spring washer. In order to install the front bearing, quite a bit of force is required. I do not have a hydraulic press, so I used a pulley puller for this. Since this bearing was new, I did not want to risk putting any force on the outer race, which might damage the bearing. To prevent this, I printed a specifically shaped spacer that would only contact the inner race, while tightening the puller. It was printed from regular PLA at 100% infill. I was not really expecting this to work, but it actually worked fine. I used a smaller type of puller to pull it over the last section. This did require a bit of force, 
but it did make it all the way to the end. To make the process easier, you could also place the spindle into the freezer for a while before starting this process. When placing the new rear bearing into the headstock, I found that it actually had a sliding fit. This actually makes sense with the way the preload is applied with the spring washer, but still I had not expected this. I gently tapped in the spindle with a brass piece of stock material, making sure only to hit the outer race of the bearing this time, since that was the part that needed to be pressed into the headstock. As mentioned, some of what I'm doing might be a bit odd, but it did get me to the end goal, and as far as I can tell, the new bearing survived the procedure. For the new controller, I will not be needing the optical encoder wheel, so I removed this before mounting the pulley back onto the spindle. And lastly, a retaining ring to make sure everything stays in place. The pulleys provide the option of choosing between three different belt ratios. Since I'm planning on making small parts initially, I have selected the option that will give me the highest spindle speed. Of course, this will come at the cost of less torque. By the time I had most of the electronic components in the cabinet, it had turned into an unworkable chaos. Also, I ran out of space with the way the components were fitted directly to the back panel. At this point, the only thing left to do was to take everything out and start again. I made notes of how everything was connected before taking out the components. In an MCO form, I had seen someone who had mounted two DIN rails to the back wall on a set of guide rails. Unfortunately, I cannot share a link since you have to be a member of that form. I will leave a link to the group below, where you can sign up in case you're interested. By now you may have noticed my preference for off-the-shelf parts for this build. I'm using several types of galvanized steel brackets from a local DIY store. This allowed me to mount the DIN rails in the cabinet with a minimal amount of drilling and tapping. I took the old ground bar from the Emco parts bin and reused it in the new situation. I placed it in a central location on the bottom panel, so the wires going to this ground bar could be as short as possible. I'm connecting anything with a metal housing or anything that has a ground connection to the central location. Lastly, one wire was connected to the mains cable, so this will make a connection to the ground pins of the wall outlet. I am reusing the existing main switch on the side of the lathe. The lathe runs on a single phase mains control, so I only have to connect two wires, a neutral line and a live wire. Behind the main switch, the power line goes to a circuit breaker. Due to a lack of space, I am only using a cable duct above and below the I.O. board. Most of the wires can go through these cable ducts, so it will look relatively clean. For power distribution, I'm using regular terminal blocks this time, instead of the PT fix type I used in an earlier build. The PT fix type blocks use up less space, but in this case I have just enough room to use the regular type. These do need to be connected through with the red plug-in bridges where needed, if you need to connect more than two wires. The terminal blocks come in different colors and sizes. The ones that I'm using for mains power can accommodate up to 2.5 mm squared wires or 14 American wire gauge. They have a quick release, so you can also take out wires if you made the wrong connection. The quick release button can also be pressed when inserting the wire. This will make that process also a bit easier. The left part of the terminal blocks is connected directly to the mains line, while the right section is switched on or off by a contactor. I will not go through all of the details of how to connect everything in this video, otherwise I could spend another hour on this, and I'm not sure if that would be the most efficient way to share what I did.
If you need more details on how the components were connected, please see the link in the description. On my website, I have included the full wiring diagram of the entire electrical cabinet. I wanted to have the on and off buttons to switch the contactor on the front panel of the CNC controller box. How the contactor is connected is already covered in the video series for my CNC router, so I will only go through the practical aspects here. I am using M22 momentary contact buttons from Eaton. There is little space left in the housing for placing these buttons, so they ended up in a bit of a weird location above the controller. Since that was already in place, I shielded it to protect it from debris while drilling. It was time again to use the Christmas tree. After making the holes, I'm filing some square pockets to accommodate the anti-rotation stops on the switches. While I was working on this cabinet, I also placed two switches on the side, which I might use later for some additional functions. For now, these are left unconnected. I'm using a cable with multiple wires between the lathe and the controller cabinet for the on-off buttons and other future switches or buttons. For connecting these low voltage wires, I'm using the smaller terminal blocks that go up to 1.5 mm squared or 16 American wire gauge. There are no less than 8 cables going to the CNC control box. To make sure that these are secured properly, I designed a cable pass-through plate for the hole that I drilled earlier. This will seal off the remainder of the hole and it has some features to which I can secure the cables with the tie wrap. There are two safety switches installed in this lathe. One for the side door where the drive belt is housed and one for the front door giving access to the work area of the lathe. I am connecting the switch on the side door in series with the external e-stop. Both are normally closed. So when either the e-stop is pressed, the side door is opened or both at the same time, this will trigger an e-stop situation. If the spindle is on while the door is opened, it will bring it to a full stop. The safety switch for the front door appeared not to be working properly anymore. It has both a normally open and a normally closed switch, but did not properly make contact when they were in the closed position. Rather than trying to clean the context, I went for a safer option and just bought a new one. This specific type was no longer available, but I found a replacement that was close enough in terms of dimensions. This door switch is connected to the M12 pin of the I.O. board and triggers the open door alarm in the controller. With the door open, the lathe can be operated in manual mode, but it cannot run any CNC program in auto mode. After connecting the switch, you only need to change two parameters in the controller to enable the safety switch feature. The fact that you can still operate it in manual mode is very useful, because you can still do tool setting with a piece of paper if you don't have a tool touch probe, which I don't. If you want to cut threads on a CNC lathe, a spindle encoder is required to synchronize the spindle speed with the speed of the z-axis, so you end up with the correct thread size. When you provide the CNC controller with the correct M code and parameters matching your thread, it will automatically feed the z-axis at the correct speed and start each consecutive pass at the same spindle angle. When you buy an encoder from SSGH, you can simply plug it into the back of the controller and it works. It's plug and play. The most common way to drive a spindle encoder is with a timing belt and a couple of pulleys. The minimum size of the pulleys was uh, dictated by the diameter of the spindle shaft. Since you can't buy pulleys with an inner diameter of 24mm, I decided to modify existing pulleys by enlarging the hole with the boring tool. This also allowed me to make my first functional part on the lathe. Since I did not feel comfortable enough at this point to modify the pulley with a CNC program, I just cut it manually by simply jogging the z-axis, while displacing the x-slide after each cut, until I reached the diameter needed to fit it on the back of the spindle. For the encoder, I 3D printed a holder that allows me to mount it beside the spindle. 
It has two slots for adjusting the belt tension as well. For the final version, I added some holes for ventilation and a rib to prevent it from bending. The pulley is driven by a spindle with a GT2 belt. If the pulleys on the spindle shaft and encoder have a different size, parameters 412 and 413 have to be set to the correct number of teeth for each pulley. The controller will then automatically compensate for this. I fitted pulleys with the same size, so for me the ratio was 1 to 1. In parameter P10 the number of pulses per revolution for the encoder is set. Of course also this is needed for the controller to figure out how far the spindle has rotated when it receives pulses from the encoder. When you rotate the spindle manually, the angular position of the spindle is updated live in the display. It is a nice way to see if your encoder is working and you can use it to do a quick check of the settings. A full rotation should bring you from 0 to 360 degrees when the parameters are set correctly. So that is it for part 5 of this retrofit. Um, for now the final part. The lathe is operational, but still some work needs to be done to add active cooling to the back of the lathe for the electronics, as well as in the controller cabinet. Besides that, I might be looking at upgrading some components in the future, but for now I would like to thank you for sticking around if you made it this far into the video. Please consider leaving a like or subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching!